Hello, I'm Adam Pascoe, former editor of BBC Ghana's World magazine. On behalf of Fred Olsen Cruises, I'd like to welcome you to my East Midlands garden. Now at the moment, because we're not cruising around the world, visiting gardens and enjoying exotic plants, Fred Olsen have asked me to share some gardening tips with you all that you can put into practice in your own gardens this year. When we moved into this garden, just before I launched BBC Gardeners World magazine in 1991, we had a blank canvas. There was nothing here at all. And this is one of the first features that we built in easy view of the house. It's a raised brick bed. The only brickwork I've ever done, and it's lasted 30 years, so not a bad job. We filled it with ericaceous acid compost and acid loving plants, which give us colour right the way through the early months of the year. Camellias in February, azaleas in March, rhododendrons through into May. And now we're into June, this beautiful Calmia latifolia that the bees absolutely love love. The back of the house is in the shade because we're now facing south and this is our sunny patio. Patio pots and colour for as much of the year as possible. Nice bench to sit out on and enjoy a cup of tea in the morning. And this herbaceous border which divides the garden. The centrepiece is the wedding cake tree, Cornus controversa variegata. Lovely variegated leaf and flowers through May. Gives us that lovely arching habit and a bed full of perennials. Delphinium bruce in colour now. Some lovely peonies, the cranesbills or hardy geraniums mixed in with alliums and astrantias and alstroemeria and a host of our other perennials, giving us colour right the way through summer. Little topical tip, remember, now is the time to be staking your perennials, any tall growing plants. Try and remember to put a stake in and tie the flower head in to stop them flopping over and blowing flat in the strong wind. We want to try and provide colour for as much of the year as possible. So through the summer months, we've got a range of things in pots from hydrangeas to grasses, agapanthus just coming into bloom now, foliage plants like hostas, miniature clematis, which are beautiful in pots, lilies, some succulent plants, great if you've got a hot patio because they don't need much watering, more hydrangeas here and there archway and trellis behind covered with wisteria and honeysuckle and clematis and this beautiful golden jasmine. When it comes to watering that's something you must be doing regularly through the summer. Quite often even if it's been raining patio pots can dry out. I like to put a lot of my plants in saucers like this hosta so that if I can top up the saucer with water it just makes sure there's a really good supply of moisture for as long as possible. Terracotta pots dry out very quickly. So when I plant things up, I always line the inside of the pot with a piece of polythene. The terracotta is a breathing material. So by putting the pot in a source of water, it takes up moisture and keeps the plant going for much, much longer during hot days. Welcome to my greenhouse. I use this to protect plants over the winter. I don't heat it, but just this extra frost protection keeps the pots of uh, acapanthus and things going right the way through the year. I mainly grow crops for the summer, tomatoes and cucumbers in particular, but during May and June, I use this for housing my pots of strawberries. By standing them on these self-watering benches, I top these trays up with moisture to keep the pots going for several days on end. The fruits themselves have got good air circulation around them. The fruits, as they ripen, aren't resting on the soil surface, so they're not getting covered with soil and being eaten by bugs. And they will ripen up nicely. I've got some nearly ready for picking here. And uh, the plants themselves will keep cropping for maybe a month on end and give you some delicious fruits to enjoy through the summer. Two problems that you can get under glass or maybe in your conservatory. One is red spider mite which has produces speckling on leaves and are webbing as well. The best thing to do to avoid that pest, which loves warm, dry conditions, is to wet the greenhouse floor down every morning, water it well to raise the humidity, and that I find deters red spider mite completely. And the other thing I do is hang up these yellow glue card traps. You could use these in your conservatory or in your greenhouse, 
and these trap any flying insects, particularly white fly. So put these around your greenhouse, in your conservatory, and by and large, it should control white fly without you needing to spray. We grow a range of fruits and vegetables, salad and herbs in our kitchen garden, mainly in raised beds. Here we've got uh, the potatoes, early varieties and a main crop Maris Piper potato. If you earth the base of the stems of potatoes up, you'll encourage little side shoots to grow out from the stems and that produces a bigger crop of potatoes. The other thing you've got to do is to keep them well watered, especially during dry weather. Along the run of the fence at the back, I've got a range of fruits, including these autumn fruited raspberries. This is a raspberry that dies down completely in the winter. You cut off all the old canes and in the spring, you get these lovely new canes developing, which will carry flowers and fruits ready for picking through July, August, September, October. I've even been picking fruit from this variety, which is called Joan Jay in December. So it's a really good crop to grow and make the most of the space underneath the wigwam canes for the climbing beans by growing salads. Uh, the foliage isn't too dense at the moment, so I can get a nice, what do you call a catch crop of salad leaves in the base of there now. Also in the kitchen garden, we've got uh, carrots, I've got some mange two peas at the back, a range of salad leaves, and of course, outdoor tomatoes. Now, when you grow tomatoes outdoors, they can succumb to a disease called blight. Phytophthora infestans. Blight attacks both potatoes and tomatoes, which are both members of the Solanum family. So I grow Mountain Magic, which is a resistant or tolerant variety uh, of tomato. And I've grown it for many years now, and it's never gone down with blight at all. It's grown as a cordon, which means I grow it as a single main stem and pinch out any side shoots like that one there, which is developing from the main stem at all. And just gradually, I just wind them into these spiral metal supports as they grow to give them support through summer. And you'll notice along the bottom of this bed, I've got a black seeping hose. I can plug the main hose into the end of this, turn the tap on and let it water for 10, 15, 20 minutes if it's been a dry day. And that gradually seeps out moisture and keeps the tomatoes well watered through the summer months. And we've come on down, I've got my outdoor strawberries here. Uh, these are covered with a frame and netting because if I don't cover these with netting, the birds will eat the lot. We do love our homegrown fruits and grow a range of top fruits and soft fruits in the garden. This is one of my uh, fan-trained apple trees. It's a variety called Ellison's Orange, which is ready for picking around about the beginning of September. And as you'll notice this year, we've got a really, really heavy crop of fruit. Far too many fruits on this. Now, apples, if they do carry a big crop of fruit, will naturally, through the summer, drop a number of the smallest immature fruits, something called June drop. And so you might find the ground underneath your apple trees scattered with little tiny fruits. If the plant itself hasn't dropped enough naturally, then you must thin out these clusters to maybe one or two fruits. Space them out along the branches. Don't be too greedy, otherwise the fruits will stay small. And if you thin them out well, you'll get a bigger crop of fruits to enjoy. And I've got a lovely crop of blackberries out the far end or some taberries here as well. So this is giving us some soft fruits to enjoy during early summer. The new canes are already growing up and it's these new canes which will carry fruit next year. So on cane fruits at any one time you've got two lots of canes. The old canes which are carrying flower and fruit grew last year. Now these new canes I've got to tie these in gently at the end of the season, cut out the fruited canes and the new canes will carry fruit next summer. Do remember that repeat flowering varieties of rose must be deadheaded regularly. So as soon as the blooms have finished, and they're faded and you've got the old flower heads here, prune them off right away. Follow the stem down. You'll notice already on this rose, I've got a new stem developing. That's a side shoot coming up and it's got a new flower developing at the top. So prune off and deadhead your roses regularly through summer. The quicker you deadhead them, the faster the new shoots will grow 
and the quicker you'll get a new flush of beautiful roses to enjoy. And you'll notice on my rose bed itself, I've underplanted the roses with a lovely short crane spill, a hardy geranium. So that's giving me extra colour to make a lovely feature out of this rose bed. There's so much more I could tell you, but from me and from Fred Olson Cruises, thank you so much for joining my garden today. We're really looking forward to welcoming you back on board Fred Olson Cruises in the future to share more plants and gardens from around the world. But until then, stay safe and enjoy your garden.